folks can take more of an equal and leadership role, especially ahead of the game when it comes to endangered species. Our panelists, in, in the order they're, they're here, first, and, and Bob, the first panelist, actually doing double duty today. He's on our second panel, too. Bob Brochide, director of your Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department. Then the Honorable Bob Rankin, representative Colorado House of Representatives. Then Tom Janofsky, commissioner from Garfield County. Luke Schaefer, West Slope Advocacy Director, Conservation Colorado. And John Alves, senior aquatic biologist, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. This is a Colorado panel, especially to talk really what's going on here with Colorado leadership on this issue. So. Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. This is really unusual sitting next to Representative Rankin that I get to uh, speak before he does. Usually I'll defer to him every time, but um, good morning. It's good to be here, and um, I'm going to kind of start this off as, as sort of a perspective from uh, a state fish and wildlife agency that's um, mandated to manage all of the state's wildlife, fish and wildlife species in the state. And, and you know, this, the species will differ. And I know we'll talk, um, uh, John and my staff will talk a little bit about a specific proposal. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk in generalities here and just kind of lay the framework for some of you who don't know uh, how we approach a, a, a conservation effort of a species or of a habitat and certainly the partnerships that we develop um, with, with a lot of the folks that are sitting on this panel and out in the room, but our, our role is, again, managing wildlife. And how we do that is the commitment of funds through our commission uh, and also through the legislature and through the governor's office that allows us to know what's out there. Um, this includes data collection, data analysis, these are not listed species. These are species under our jurisdiction, and, and we really need to know where these species are and what sort of uh, population that they are being managed at. We conduct lots of scientific research. Colorado has been blessed is to continue to have well, I mean, one of the more robust uh, science and research uh, arms within the, uh, within the West that we do commit and want to make sure that our decisions uh, on management are based on science. Um, we also use that science. We work at local habitat enhancement issues um, from conservation easements to uh, just uh, farm bill related actions and things like that to work with landowners to restore that habitat and make sure that species stays abundant. We also develop in that process is relationships with non-governmental organizations private landowners, our, our other state and federal agency partners to develop conservation plans or agreements that are going to allow that species to continue to flourish into the future. Our goal is to prevent listing. Our goal is to get to these species prior to the, the threats that then cause um, a decision by the Fish and Wildlife Service is whether to list that species or not. So keeping these species abundant is very, very important. The other is, and, and both Governor Hickenlooper and Mead mentioned earlier, is that when they're on the list, we want to get them off, and we want to get them off in a safe uh, and, and secure way into the future. Those partnerships that we, all of those things that we're doing leads to partnerships in conservation actions. That means we are all sharing the data, we are all sharing the research, and we're all working together to do habitat enhancement that is non-regulatory, it's incentive-based, and voluntary in most cases. This is certainly uh, with species like the black-footed ferret that were mentioned earlier, um, very, very strong and incentive and voluntary-based conservation actions. That that partnership then allows us to pool our funding sources. Funding is a major issue associated with uh, non-hunted species or non-fish species for state wildlife agencies. Um, we continued, and, and Colorado is no exception, has continued to use money derived from the sale of hunting fishing license to manage all, wild, all other wildlife species, whether they are hunted or not as Governor Mead laid out earlier, was the continuing growing listing of species on the, uh, at least being petitioned, is continuing to take a lot of our resources um, at the state level 
And Colorado, again, is also blessed, too, that we do have a significant fund sources, uh, a diversity of fund sources that allow us to keep these species common. The listing, when a species then becomes petitioned for listing, then the, the ball game sort of changes. Um, that science, that data, those partnerships that come forward uh, do get evaluated by the Fish and Wildlife Services and, and we are strong proponents of the peace policy or the policy of evaluating conservation efforts when making listing decisions. See, when as a, as a state agency and, and to put yourself in our shoes, as we've been working with landowners, we've been working with local governments and, and non-governmental organizations and federal land management agencies on a plan. That plan has been working or, or uh, is producing successful results. And then when a, when a listing petition comes in, that, uh, that effort and that information then comes rolls, hopefully rolls into that decision-making process. And if it becomes a listed species, our role and our authority then diminishes out as a result of that. This, is the, this becomes a federal trust species. It's the Fish and Wildlife Service's responsibility to manage. And uh, so our role uh, definitely changes uh, when we talk about a listing decision. I also want to talk a little bit, too, for the states. Um, the state of Colorado is our fund sources right now. Uh, right now, through state wildlife grants, we get about $1.2 million. And this is generated through our state wildlife action plan. It's congressionally appropriated. And, and we use that money to conserve threatened and endangered species primarily. Great Outdoors Colorado is a lottery money that we get. We are at about $4.3 million that we are investing in uh, non-listed species um, to, for a variety of habitat enhancements and acquisitions and research and monitoring those. The other big um, uh, fund source that we get is severance tax. Um, this is, we call it Species Conservation Trust Fund. This is a severance tax derived from um, mineral development um, throughout the state. That's about $3 million. So for the industry uh, partners that are sitting out there, we are using that money to prevent these listings and make sure that these species remain abundant out there as well. Uh, part of that $3 million, $2 million goes to uh, research and uh, other monitoring efforts and one million of that is, is dedicated to actual on the ground projects and implementation. Some of the challenges, and I'll wrap up real quick and, and move this on, is some of the challenges that we're looking at, of course they're all, at the species level there are challenges with each species together, but I was trying to roll these up into some of, some of the take home messages from, from a state wildlife agency's director perspective that we must, um, and this is we, this is the collective we in this room, is to ensure that transparency uh, with our partners continues and, and it becomes even more robust in the future. That includes transparency of the data, transparency of our efforts, and transparency of any plans that we have to keep these species common. That provides, not only it's the right thing to do, um, but it provides that regulatory certainty that if the species were to be listed, that transparency and that partnership can continue to roll without the fear of the regulatory uh, hammer. Incentive-based conservation is absolutely critical. Um, that we've had remarkable success and uh, for a lot of species, and it's going to become even more critical as we look down the road into the future. And this is not just financial. This is not just financial incentives. Habitat-based pr approaches for species conservation is the future. Um, we cannot continue to take a species-by-species species approach to, uh, to manage these uh, fish and wildlife that are on this landscape. We, with the growth projections we have, we have to look at habitat-based, range-wide approaches. And if that's just in Colorado, or that's a multi-state effort, much like the greater sage-grouse, that's, that's where the future is, and that's where we need to continue to go. But those habitat-based approaches need to absolutely fully consider the working landscapes that are out there right now. Those are future partners, and we can't leave those folks behind. The final... Uh, take home message I guess I would leave is that the, the ability for us to continue to, to develop data and science needs to continue to drive this decision making. This is getting harder and from a, from a state with a, a 
uh, stagnant or even shrinking budgets. Research is, is typically one of those first areas of, of, of wildlife agencies that gets cut. Um, we have to continue to work with partners out there that uh, to expand that ability to provide data and science. This is this is the heart of the litigation that, that Governor Mead spoke about. It'll usually boil down to science, and it's also science is what the Fish and Wildlife Service and us are going to use as we start to develop action plans or for the services for listing decisions. Those areas, I believe, are kind of common to all um, and will certainly vary by the by species by species, but I think flexibility, adaptability, transparency, those are the things that are going to continue to allow us to develop partners like many of the folks that are sitting at this table that will allow us to continue to keep these species common and not listed, and when they are listed is to get them off the list. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide these comments to you all this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm uh, Bob Rankin, a state uh, representative. You know, I have been involved in sort of the political process and these issues for about six years, and Colorado is in a much better place today than we were six years ago. And that's sort of the story that I think we'll tell, uh, some of us will tell. I'm honored to be sitting here at the table with people who've made that happen because I spend my time sitting in meetings in the legislature but I have been able to help carry the ball in the state legislature. And I think the role of state legislatures is important. And so it's worth telling the story. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the path to get to a, a bill that we passed last year with the help of some of my colleagues here at the table, in fact, all of them. And um, let me start by telling you how I got interested or why I'm so interested in this. I represent three counties in Northwest Colorado, literally 11,000 square miles, about 9,000 people. And those people are scattered in nine little medium-sized towns throughout this vast area, surrounded by public lands. My district is 70% federal lands and another component of state lands and, and conservation easements. So the people there are very dependent on what happens on these federal lands and the decisions involved. You know, there are about 15,000 gas and oil wells in my district, three big open pit coal mines. Uh, there's uh, a large number of fourth generation ranching families who depend on grazing rights on public lands, very much affected by species. And there's a lot of hunting and, and, and fishing that's part of the economy. So when I started running for office, I actually ran for state Senate throughout all of a large part of Western Colorado and then the House District. The thing I heard most about was the frustration that people felt because they felt they were not in control of their own destiny. There had been several big decisions made on oil and gas development where one example, folks worked together for five years to come up with a solution, and it was overturned overnight by a decision by the then uh, secretary. So, you know, they just felt they had no say whatsoever in what happened. The BLM Forest Service tended to do analyses on a large regional basis and didn't really focus on the local differences. Uh, and the process was long and drawn out. So I went into the legislature with this as my number one priority, that I had to try to help these folks uh, have some say in their own futures and what happened around them, because we've heard before and we'll hear again, you know, they people, local people really do care about taking care of land. They, they're, they're conservationists and these fourth generation families know the land better than anybody. And, and, you know, given the incentives and opportunities, they clearly want to participate. So I'm now in my fourth year in office. I was on the agriculture and, and local government committees, agricultural and natural resources. I was actually able to carry the bill that helped my good friend Bob's predecessor on species protection. Uh, and, and I got very involved in these issues of local government. Um, but so I started, my first idea was to run a bill to do something about this. So my first year in office, I ran a bill and I said, the state must do an economic analysis for any federal land decision and use that to take a position.
And well, that wasn't very popular. So, you know, and I, I didn't really understand bipartisan politics in my first year, like most of us were naive when we first go in. So that bill failed. But having um, a lot of incentives from all of my constituents, I said, well, I'll try again. So the second year I ran another bill and it said, we will create a public lands council, much like I believe Utah has other states follow that model. And that will guide uh, what the state's position on these uh, issues. Well, that didn't go over very well. So <laughs> again, I was uh, sort of taking a, a a regional partisan position uh, in that I wanted this, this council was structured to help my district, but not necessarily much else. Um, and along the way, um, another things had started to happen. Governor Hickenlooper had gotten involved in this and hired John Swart out, who's here today, who's one of my heroes in this whole area. Um, and John had picked up the, um, the sage grouse issue and was you know had started to form this team that we hear about now and so we were making progress and so the, the story was well we don't need that you know we don't need another bureaucracy you know coloradans we don't like councils and although we sure have a lot of them but so so we didn't do that and so the third year i said well i'm not going to give up my folks are still not involved enough in the process well, this, thing, this time things were different. Uh, Director Brushad had come on board with fantastic experience from Arizona and talked to us about the, you know, the ability of planning ahead. And he just talked about that issue. If you have a plan in place, you're in much better position to take on species issues and, and all of these other issues. So Bob was on board and talked to us a lot about it. John Swartout had become a real factor on the governor's staff and, and was um, everywhere. And I was able, I finally was starting to understand politics a little bit after three years. So I teamed up with, uh, uh, I'm Republican, and I teamed up with a Democrat representative, uh, Representative Becker, who deserves an awful lot of credit. She lives in Boulder, but her district extends out into some of Western Colorado. She had been a Forest Service lawyer working on the NEPA process. And she clearly understood and could articulate the frustration of local folks and having to deal with this long drawn out process. And she did that eloquently helped me do that. And we also were able to, at this point, convince our, uh, our friends on the conservation side, Conservation Colorado, and Luke is here and maybe can talk about this some, that it really is good to have local involvement. You know, the local folks really are, um, do care about the environment and care about protecting species and that sometimes they have knowledge that can really play into the, to this. And so what we did was instead of trying to create a big council or demand some analysis, we simply set up a fund that local governments could call on, hopefully working together. Now, the situation had been when I first started into this that the state had a sage grouse mapping, habitat mapping effort going on as did my good friend Tom Jankowski, county commissioner sitting here, and they didn't look very much alike. They were based on different science and, and they actually did not talk to each other. So we had two different mapping efforts going on in the state and the BLM said, you know, who do we listen to? You know, and so, so both, both sides were trying to lobby the BLM for their ma mapping technology. And, and, and so, what's happened since, and Tom will tell you more about it, is to pull those efforts together. So what this bill really did was say, okay, the state will give you grant money, um, and it comes from severance taxes and, and federal minimum lease, by the way, this, this fund. We, we will give you a grant if you'll work together, and if you, and it also required the state, and the director sitting next to me, to help with those grants. And so the grant had to be formulated with multiple entities with state support. So we were all pulling together and we um, we're just now actually we passed this bill last year. So this is the first time grants have actually uh, started to play into it. So with that, uh, you know, I'm going to pass it along and I'm sure Commissioner Jankowski, who I'm basically leading this effort, will tell you more about that. But to summarize, I think that 
you know, our state certainly is looking internally to see how our departments and systems work together so that we can be a better partner with, the, with our federal partners and on our own state lands. Now, this is, a, this is somewhat driven by the fact that in other states, there are movements for, that say the state could manage land better and we should take back management of federal lands. My view is that's a long term. I mean, that's a political process and long term. But I think it motivates us to look for better methods of working together, to be stronger partners together. And I, state that I think the state legislature can dig deep to find out how our systems are really working internally so that we have collaborative efforts. We put our best foot forward and we can be a stronger and, and I would say more muscular partner with the federal government. So that's what this is all about. It's, it's an alternative to saying the state can manage the land better, saying that we can do a better job together. So thank you. Just to give you a perspective of Garfield County, Garfield County is in uh, western Colorado. Starts at, the, uh, at Glenwood Canyon, which is about um, 40 miles west of the Vale and stretches about 120 miles to the Utah border. And most of my experience with uh, ESA has been on sage grouse. I'm going to kind of tell you the story of uh, Garfield County and, and sage grouse and, and where we are today. Um, you all know that uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't list the, the greater sage grouse. However, uh, BLM, through their EIS on uh, habitat for greater sage grouse, a record of decision, has more or less established an administrative listing, at least on public lands. In, in Garfield County, we're on the southeast edge of the, uh, the range of the habitat, and uh, there aren't a lot of birds in our, in our county. It's only about 500 birds, and, and they do deserve to be protected. Um, one of the things with the habitat is in the, in the range itself. It's a, it's a land, large, expansive landscape habitat with uh, rolling hills of sagebrush. But in Garfield County, we are, our habitat's on ridge tops at about 7,000 to 7,500 feet. And, and it's interspersed with uh, aspen, black timber, um, gamble oak, and uh, pinyon juniper forests, as well as there's large uh, differences in topography. So when we first saw the, uh, the map, uh, when we, as a cooperating agency, when we sat down with the BLM, we first saw the map, we knew immediately that there were areas that were not habitat in our county. And we tried to express that to the BLM. Uh, the map that was being used used a one kilometer grid. And uh, we affectionately started calling that map the red blob. Um, and, and after not being listened to and much frustration, we went out and hired uh, consultants to map sage grouse habitat in our county and their mapping used two different models at a, a two meter uh, grid and and came back with about 88,000 acres of uh, priority habitat in Garfield County compared to 220,000 acres that was being used in the BLM map. That since has been uh, twice peer reviewed and, and we hope it uh, goes to publication soon. Then we, we started looking at the science, and the, the foundation of the science on the uh, BLM uh, EIS was pri primarily the NTT report. And again, that NTT report was based on um, this large, expansive habitat of rolling sagebrush and didn't really work real well in our county. Let's take, for example, the Four Mile Buffer. The Four Mile Buffer around Lex, Lex being the mating area for sage grouse, uh, and the, within that four miles, just about 100% of the um, nesting and brooding takes place. Well, in, in Garfield County, if you start with it, with a Lex, you go uh, down a hilltop through a, a aspen forest, you go down into a valley, you come back up the other side into a black timber forest, and then you're on the next ridge top where you, you're back into sagebrush, and yet you've only gone about two miles. And so uh, that four mile that four mile buffer just didn't work very well for us. Then the next thing was the, the, the theory that uh, sage grouse don't work well in fragmented habitat. Well, in our county, all the habitat's fragmented. So, and the birds do get from area to area by flying. 
And then there's another theory that uh, oil and gas production would uh, force the birds out of their, their habitat and they wouldn't come back into the, the habitat. But again, in our county, the largest uh, lek with strutting males is on a reclaimed gas pad. So there were a lot of, lot of things that we didn't uh, agree with in, uh, that was going on in the, the B, uh, BLM EIS. And we also didn't agree with, uh, we, we felt some of the procedures and policies that were being used in the EIS weren't correct. And this really um, that led us to the point, um, you know, we, we're really ripe for a, a lawsuit. And, and, you know, we are, we are an energy rich county. Uh, the priority habitat in our county is already 100% leased. Uh, we estimate there's $40 billion worth of natural reserves in, in, under that habitat. We, um, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, revenues back to governments, let alone the uh, economic engine and jobs that that, that industry creates. But instead of a lawsuit, and thanks to Representative Rankin, um, we, we have used his legislation uh, signed by Governor Hickenlooper through uh, Associated Governments in Northwest Colorado. We went out for a grant, received a grant, and have an MOU with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to map all of the habitat in Colorado. And we do have a, a commitment from um, the BLM if, they, if that a new map is presented to them that they will accept that map and, and amend their EIS. And we're, we're very hopeful that uh, that happens and because we know the bird can be protected and yet with uh, the correct mapping, we can get to over 90% of the resources in that area. And, and just to finish that out, we uh, believe after that's done that CPW is gonna have the, the best mapping in the United States for not only sage grouse habitat, but sagebrush habitat as well. Good morning. Uh, I'm Luke Shea from the West Slope Advocacy Director for Conservation Colorado and uh, provide a little perspective who we are. We're a, a conservation group that, that works on a statewide basis uh, with offices in Denver, Pueblo, Durango, Grand Junction, and in Craig. Um, I'm, I work in, and live in, in Craig, Colorado, and yes, that's right, there's a tree hugger in Craig. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and, and being proactive. And I, I think I, my career has long, is largely been based upon uh, collaboration from collaboration to collaboration, uh, from the day I started to to to, to this day. Um, worked with some of the folks in this room on a collaborative around a BLM planning process in Northwest Colorado that. Um, is, is still unrivaled for the detail and, and, and sort of difficulty and, and, and level of investment. Um, and, and that has definitely colored my perspective about working together in a way to, to reach a, a commonly held goal. And, and that's the thing that, you know, um, there's difference of opinion on how to get there uh, in almost all cases. Um, but the idea is that to be able to, to uh, have those opinions articulated in a way that we're hearing and listening to one another to gain the perspectives of where everyone is coming from. Instead of having the conversation dominated by entrenched positions, um, we, we dive into those details in a way that, uh, that allows us a, a new level of perspective um, to, to bring the, the, uh, the salient points to bear. And, I feel as if that is largely lost in the conversations around the ESA. It becomes a policy-driven and political-driven issue instead of something that focuses simply upon trying to do better than what we have done before. It requires taking responsibility and accountability that we've done some things, we've made some poor choices in some cases, but that doesn't mean that we're wrong. And I say we. It's not pointing fingers. It's not, it's not creating good guys versus bad guys. It's, it's not making an issue about black and white. It's, it's bringing people into the fold to, 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 to examine all the shades of gray that exist um, instead of, in, instead of uh, slinging mud at one another. And, and that is what is, is constantly heard through, through the media and, and through general discussions is that it's just us versus them. Um, you can't do that in Western landscapes. You know, places like Moffat County, we're all neighbors. 
one way or the other. You know, we're going to disagree about a lot of stuff, but we're not going to be disagreeable. Because um, I'm going to see Jeff and Chuck at, at the grocery store. It, it, it's one where I want to be able to, to have these conversations, not be shut down. Um, and part of that, that process is about educating people about the facts and issues. My organization partnered with CPW and their Watchable Wildlife Program, as well as local landowners, to try and get folks out on the ground to understand the landscape itself. While greater sage grouse were the issue in Moffat County, um, from, from an outsider perspective, the issue was about the landscape. And what I wanted folks to understand was not just the, this large expanse of sagebrush sea, but also understanding the people that live there. They're not observers of nature. You know, ag producers, um, oil and gas industry workers, they're direct participants. And understanding that perspective um, is an enlightening experience for somebody that's coming over from Denver or Boston or wherever. Um, over the course of six years, we brought out 1,200 people out to various sage grouse selects in, in Moffat County. And we had folks from literally all over the country and the world that showed up. We had, I don't know how many um, media members that, that came out. And I have literally no idea how many agency and, and, and political officials that, that, that came out over the years. And at the end of it, everyone would always say, I, I get a little bit of what you're talking about. It's not black and white. Because everyone would come in, but because they had heard through you know media or whatnot that it, it was oil and gas industry's fault. It's ranchers' fault. It's housing developers' fault. It's no one's fault. It is a, it is a, a collection of, of um, simple miscalculations that have occurred over the years. Um, but it doesn't mean that we've foreclosed upon future opportunities. Um, and, and that's where we have these discussions and we're able to, to better enlighten people's perspectives. But I, I want to be clear about my intent in being here. First and foremost, I'm an ardent supporter of the ESA. I think it's a, a, a reflection of the values that exist in our nation and, and make us uh, a unique case example in this world. Um, that said, my goal working on endangered species issues is to go far and beyond the ESA. Not simply on, on regulatory practices or the policy, but to create a level of durability that this is going to exist regardless of the characters that, that, that are there. There's a new level of investment by all the various actors that have investments on these landscapes um, so that we're, we can ensure that there is that, that buy-in to continue forward. You, you know that if you do good here, it's gonna set up the next step. Unfortunately, for, for many, in much of the case, political purposes, the ESA is that, that third rail. It causes people to shut down. It causes folks to, to step away, dig their boot heels in as deep as they can and not move. That is unfortunate because that doesn't need to be the case, but it often is. And that's why we, we try to you know, avoid listings in both the, the greater and Gunnison and sage grouse processes. That's why you know, a collection of us worked you know, tirelessly for a month and a half in a, in a Hail Mary effort to, to avoid a Gunnison listing. We weren't able to get there, but we still hold out the hope that, and, and firmly believe, at least from my perspective, that we're gonna come up with the, the, uh, the state, local, and federal regulatory certainty that is required by Fish and Wildlife to delist that species and have the state manage it. And, and have that happen in a way that ensures that genera generation after generation are not only going to enjoy the species and the specter of grouse strutting on lex, but they're gonna have the, these, these large scale landscapes, in the case of Gunnison, stretching all of Southwest Colorado that, that are gonna be a, a gift for years to come. And uh, I'm gonna try and be brief because brevity is the brother of brilliance. Um, but I, I, I wanna to touch on the proactive nature. There was a lot of that around the greater sage grouse with both the local working groups as well as the statewide initiative that eventually came, uh, came and became a part of the statewide conservation plan. Um, and I completely agree with, with uh, Director Broshi's comments about uh, incentive-based approaches and voluntary measures being a key to things. Um, 
But there's also the fact that we need to have regulatory certainty. There is a regulatory floor that needs to exist within these planning processes so that we don't end up having to do the mad scramble at the end to satisfy um, some of the larger constructs of both the ESA but also federal land planning processes. And that means having a level of intention that we're going to ensure that we have everything under the sun. Um, we're going to ensure that we have this regulatory floor, but we're also going to make sure that um, whether it be oil and gas operators or landowners have an incentive to go far and beyond whatever that regulatory floor is. Um, that creates that level of investment that I talk about. Um, and, and we need to be identifying these, these uh, individual species and landscapes that they uh, inhabit and targeting them uh, on the earliest basis possible, which goes towards ensuring that we're funding both our federal and state agencies to, to a degree which they can do their jobs effectively. Um, it is a constant struggle, um, it, regardless of the agency that you talk about, to, to ensure that every year they're able to meet the basic functions or, or as well as um, take on those, those more aspirational goals. Um, if we want to, to be able to deal with these, these extremely complicated issues, we have to ensure that uh, those resources are readily available. Um, and, I'll, and I'll conclude with saying, I've said uh, many, many times that the, in particular, the greater sage grouse effort um, impressed the hell out of me. The ability for a lot of disparate interests to come together around a collective goal, work in an intensive fashion um, to achieve that goal, and, and actually seeing it come to fruition w w was impressive. And, and while I share uh, Governor Meade's uh, consternation about the litigation that follows, I do view the fact that we, we met our goal. Um, we, 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 we were able to avoid a listing, and we were able to create, um, I, I think, a, a robust and durable planning fr framework that's going to outlive most of us. And, and that is something that um, I will always be proud of, but I'll also be extremely impressed by um, all the folks that, that invested in that process. Thanks. I guess I'm the only one that has a presentation today. Um, my name is John Alves. I'm a senior aquatic biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and I am responsible for managing aquatic resources in the southwest part of the state. It extends from the Sangre de Cristo Mountains to Utah, from Grand Mesa to New Mexico. And I want to talk to you about a species that's uh, especially special to me, I guess. Uh, been working on Rio Grande cutthroat since uh, 1991. And um, this is a Rio Grande cutthroat. It's one of three species native to Colorado waters. This one um, inhabits the Rio Grande from the headwaters down to the Pecos River and the Canadian River watersheds in New Mexico. As you can see, it is a brilliantly colored fish during spawning season. And typical of all cutthroat, the spots are sort of concentrated toward the tail. Uh, introduction, um, I can't see the, <laughs> the screen very well here, so bear with me. But um, like I said, it's one of three species of cutthroat in Colorado. One species, the yellow fin, is now extinct that we think of. Um, Historic range, like I said, extends all the way down the Pecos River, and currently we, the Rio Grande cutthroat occupies about 12% of uh, historic range. And Colorado has had an active and proactive conservation program since 1973, and I've been working on it since 1991. Status, as you can see, there's been a long, long history of uh, various status um, for the Rio Grande cutthroat. In 1973, following the Endangered Species Act, um, 
the cutthroat was listed as threatened, basically because we didn't know a lot about the distribution and status of the cutthroat. So it was listed as threatened, and 11 years later, in 1984, it was uh, downlisted because we completed all the goals of the recovery plan. I guess it's okay. Since 1984, um, there's, there, there were no petitions until 1998. This petition under ESA, as you can see, is it, it was not substantial for listing. Um, and then uh, there's been various petitions and and appeals and status assessments, but I want to focus in on 2008 and 2014 in particular. In 2008, um, following a status assessment by Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, they ruled that it was warranted but precluded with the, I think it was value of nine down on, pretty low down on the, on the scale for re, for the review. And it was based on the threats to the species, but it started out as being a, an analysis of uh, specific portion of range. Then in, uh, in 2011, we had the multi-district settlement that led to another species status assessment and under 12-month finding. And then in 2014, following uh, another uh, status assessment, it was ruled not warranted. I want to just focus in a little bit on the 2008 status assessment. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service applied a, what we concluded was a very, very narrowly defined arbitrary population criteria that was different from the 2002 or 2004 status assessment. There was a lot of uh, concern expressed for climate change and the inability of the agencies to keep up with uh, escalating global clim climate change and the impacts on populations. As I, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and New Mexico Department of Game and Fish objected to the decision. Um, and the decision was not, we felt was not consistent with other status assessments, um, like considering the Colorado River cutthroat in 2007, the West Slope cutthroat. Some of the things that were different about the 2014 status assessment was that the Fish and Wildlife Service income in collaboration with the Rio Grande Cutthroat Conservation Team used a new analysis for measuring overall viability and extinction risk through forecasting the number and distribution of, of surviving populations into the future. They used a concept called the three R's, which involves, oops, sorry, involves resiliency, representation, and redundancy. And uh, resiliency is the ability of the populations to uh, stochastic events. Representation is, uh, you know, we want, we want to have a representation across all watersheds and throughout the historic range. And redundancy is um, the ability, or you want populations to be um, replicated across the landscape, both genetically and uh, phenotypically. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service came up with the probability of persistence model that uh, included all species, or I mean all populations of Rio Grande cutthroat, irregardless of their size and genetic status. In the previous status assessment, there was a very few populations that made the criteria for, uh, for listing. This way, um, you had this range of impacts uh, and survivability of the population and not just a few populations that meet the certain criteria. The signatory partners agreed to implement the strategies for long-term viability. I just want to talk a little bit more about some of the collaborative conservation efforts that have been taking place for over 20 years now. But the most recent one is uh, the Rio Grande Cutthroat Conservation Team that was formed in 2003. 
Uh, the purpose was to assure the long-term viability of Rio Grande cutthroat throughout its historic range and reduce the likelihood that it would be listed under ESA. Uh, that conservation again was renewed in 2013. Colorado Parks and Wildlife and New Mexico Department of Games share the lead are the lead agencies in the conservation team and it also involves the federal agencies in both states, Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, Park Service, and uh, several Native American tribes. We also have uh, supporting organizations like Trout Unlimited and recently the 10 County Coalition, which is represented by county commissioners from 10 counties in Southern Colorado that have Rio Grande Cutthroat within their jurisdiction. Now, the other strategy, uh, other collaborative conservation effort includes the Rio Grande Cutthroat Conservation Strategy, strategy that we finalized in 2013, following a template of the McLeod River Red Band Trout Management Plan, where uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that that species could go from candidate to not warrant it based on the management plan. The strategy provides for long-term viability of Rio Grande cutthroat to minimize the impacts, the threats of the species across the range and promoting conservation. Uh, it provides a framework of objectives and associated actions that can be implemented to abate the threats, address information gaps and guide monitoring efforts. And once again, conservation team signatory partners agreed to implement these conservation measures and going forward. And finally, I want to address the, the support that we have from the local um, uh, private landowners, the Trinchera Ranch, Cielo Vista Ranch, Vermeil Park Ranch, and the Humphreys Lodge LLC. Trinchera Ranch and Cielo Vista and Bermeo all have our big land tracks on the eastern side of the San Luis Valley and are very or the cornerstone of Rio Grande cutthroat conservation as they protected many of the streams where historic populations occurred. And they continue to, to support our conservation measures. Uh, Humphreys Lodge is, is where we have our wild brood stock for Rio Grande cutthroat and they've been supportive of not only Rio Grande cutthroat but Rio Grande chub and boreal toad. And finally again the 10 county coalition was recently formed to uh, help support our efforts through the ESA process and uh, it was their letter that was sent to the Fish and Wildlife Service that helped uh, show that we had local support for our conservation measures and the strategy. And Trout and Lim has always been there helping us, uh, supporting us with um, on projects to reintroduce Rio Grande Cutthroat. And the product of a successful conservation program is the opportunity for anglers to go out and catch the species that we're trying to conserve by keeping Rio Grande Cutthroat off the endangered species list it provides Colorado and New Mexico with the authority to continue to manage those species and provides anglers with an opportunity to catch one of the rare cutthroats in Western North America. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions um, for the panel. Now, we had a bunch, we, uh, Zach and I brainstormed with the panelists to get the discussion going, but I don't want to get to all those because I want to leave plenty of time for you folks and your questions. Um, now, they may choose to answer one anyway, but that's their prerogative that, that they that thought maybe I was going to ask. But there's a couple that I think I can ask to get the discussion going, and it seems... Um, that the ESA is essentially, for good or evil, sort of forced everyone into these collaborative, democratic sort of ways to talk to each other. That without the ESA, I don't know if it would have happened. But that's not really my question. 
the first question is about collaboration for any and all of the panelists. How has it evolved in the state of Colorado over the last few years? And where are you making progress? And where do you, do you all feel that you still could work harder to make more progress on collaboration? And anyone is both welcome to answer that and respond to another panelist if you so choose. And so anyone can fire away first. I guess I'll take a first crack at that. I'd probably say, since I've only been here a couple of years, but uh, uh, certainly I think our, our as, a, as a state and as a wildlife agency, the, um, our collaboration with new and emerging uh, non-governmental organizations, um, that we're, we have a lot more common that way. Um, but also a real big effort is, is what Representative Rankin was talking about, is our ability now to partner with local governments and, and private landowners to achieve uh, levels of conservation that I, I don't think we have done consistently um, or it was it was a, a county here or a city municipality there but I think with Representative Rankin was explaining was now we're talking a broad sweeping coordination with the county government level great fire away well, I, I think I did address this to some extent uh, by going back about six years ago when I first got involved. So it's been both incrementally and sort of uh, the thought process has also evolved. But at the time, we had independent counties operating separately. Uh, Commissioner Jankowski described the mapping effort on sage grouse. So the increments have been really Governor Hickenlooper getting involved uh, with the Western States Governor, and then the hiring of his uh, staff member, John Swartout, uh, to work across the counties and with the federal government. And then uh, Bob uh, Bushart coming in from Arizona with his background in planning and getting ahead of the game uh, and, and building uh, coalitions. And then I think some, uh, Certainly, um, in the legislature, we talked a lot more about these kinds of things and getting counties to work together. I think it's worth pointing out, Colorado is a little bit unique because about 85% of the people live in urban areas. And, and so very few of the legislators are, and, and, and that means a lot of the state government focuses on urban areas along the, the uh, interstate corridors. So there are very, very few actually by number, man, like 12 representatives and, and senators out of 100 who actually represent rural areas and, and even fewer of those are actually western Colorado where a lot of this occurs and so you know it's difficult to get um, attention you know you can pound on the podium talk about rural Colorado and western Colorado and of course I do that all the time but it's still uh, been difficult to kind of get the thought process to shift to, to some of these issues and, and we're doing that and I think there has been quite an evolution. I, I think Colorado really is in a good space right now because of Governor Hickenlooper's leadership, because of our new staff members and because we've um, got uh, Commissioner Jankowski running this effort that's going to be an example throughout the state where we need to put our heads together to solve a problem. So I, I do think it's quite different and, and a good lesson in the evolution of thinking around species protection and, and actually partnership with the federal government across all of our uh, issues. Any other folks? Well, I'll say that, as I mentioned, um, I, I've, I've seen these for, for uh, over the past decade as uh, these collaborative processes as a, a, a way of doing business and to a certain degree it's a little bit of that West Slope way of life. Uh, I will say I believe that there is a greater level of intention um, particularly from from leadership and, un, and un, particularly in understanding that the onus can't be put on local governments to, to be uh, the constant leaders in this process. Um, that there's a great deal of responsibilities that, that are placed on local governments and in, in, in leading far-ranging um, uh, uh, issues such as uh, endangered species issues and species conservation efforts on landscape levels is it, a little bit of an unfair burden to put on uh, county commissioners and, and city council people. Um, so that, that leadership at the state and federal level I, I think is is continued to um, evolve and, and, and continue to grow uh, over the past decade and understanding that um, 
there has to be a, a capitalization upon these opportunities because they not only work for individual landscapes or species, but they bleed into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. You know, for um, many years, the states of Colorado and New Mexico, in terms of the Rio Grande Cutthroat Conservation, worked independently of each other, occasionally coming together to do a, a joint uh, restoration project that crossed state lines. But basically, we were working on our own until about 2002 3 when we formed the Rio Grande Cutthroat Conservation Team, which led to all the federal and state partners and and uh, supporting organizations coming together in a collaborative way to work in a positive direction to um, for the benefit of, of Rio Grande Cutthroat and to preclude with the goal to preclude listing under ESA. And that same thing goes for Colorado River Cutthroat on Northwest Colorado too, where we work with Utah and Wyoming. Okay, now, I'll, let me look around the room, so if you've got a question, get your hand up, um, and let me get to him, you with the mic. And Zach, should I repeat it again, just to make sure that the people watching get it, or you think the mic's good enough? Okay. Thank you. So, I have a question here. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Bob Brochide and perhaps Representative Rankin. Do you want to identify yourself, too, just so everybody knows who you are? Dr. Rob Roy Ramey. Um, as a long-term conservation biologist and student of the Endangered Species Act, I applaud your interest in transparency uh, in endangered species decisions, particularly with data. And in my direct experience, that is essential to successful single species and multi-species conservation efforts. Um, however, the state finds itself, and, and this is not unique to Colorado necessarily, in the position of having three potentially conflicting interests. The interest in data transparency, which would allow for independent third-party analysis of data sets on endangered species. Under state statute in Colorado, the location of species cannot be revealed uh, on private lands without permission of the landowner, thus protecting landowner rights. And then third, in few narrow cases, the state may not want to allow data out that reveals the location of sensitive species, such as nesting sites. So um, going to specifics, what policies do you currently have or envision developing that would allow access to the data while protecting the private property rights and also the uh, sensitive species information and in developing those, have you considered any of the data share and non-disclosure agreements used in the medical field? Thank you. No, I, I won't, uh, I'll try to hit the main um, point is, is, or at least one of your points was the release of data. Um, legislatively, statutorily, we're restricted from releasing data. Um, I do not like to violate that. Um, I think that's very important to getting to not just transparency by itself, but it's that um, it's the assurances also side that we've also got to look at. And withholding that data on private land is essential to that, to to not just be us meeting state law, but it's also to if we're going to be in partnership with these folks, this data needs to be kept as confidential as possible and this is I think what Governor Mead was getting at earlier is that you, you can't uh, shoot shovel and shut up will 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 be the, the, the law of the land and, and we're seeing that as well but we do do day share agreements um, as, as Commissioner Jankowski was talking about we are working with them the the problem is is that it gets into the wrong hands and um, and or through the federal process of who's who's data sequestration and is not as strong as ours and it gives us pause because at the end of the day it's it's the credibility this agency is going to have as we're going out and talking to landowners um in, in talking about what this means some folks got to remember like uh, luke brought up the gunnison sage grouse this may have been the only experience some of these landowners have had with a, with a potentially listed endangered species that's it and we have one shot at keeping that level of trust 
of transparency and credibility that, that we can maintain in that process. So um, we're going to continue to withhold that data, only release it under agreements and, and, and uh, or other provisions. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. And uh, uh, third party reviews, uh, it's getting interesting. Um, we're starting to see uh, where states were pri the primary source for data. We're seeing a lot of other third parties that are coming forward with the data and expertise. Some of them are ex-state fish and wildlife people as well. I think that's a discussion we've got to have is how do we, uh, how do we incorporate them, provide a, 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 a peer review, a true peer review, um, and help us in that process of, of that data. Um, that's something I think we've got to wrestle with for sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Remy, thank you for your contribution to this effort over the years. You're certainly one of the leaders, and you always ask the hard questions, I've noticed. <laughs> uh, um, I just say I hope we're now sharing the data with between the mapping efforts going on at the county level and the state, which we were not when you, you and I first talked. So. Got some hands. Right here. Brian Brothers the National Audubon Society. Yeah, yeah speak loud. Try again. I, that's on. Um, Brian Rutledge with the National Audubon Society. Some of you have alluded to this, but I'd like to get some more direct response. There's a natural side effect of the petitioning process under the ESA, and that is a very direct singular focus on a single species. And I want to ask what you think about some more anticipatory effort around habitats as opposed to waiting for uh, an opportunity, let's say, to respond to a petition. <laughs> They're all looking at me. <laughs> no, that's a good question, Brian. I, and I was one who alluded to that. Um, the, the, the petitioning process um, does, we, we look at the species, the species, and then we rush and we try to get the data. And at the end of the day, there's multiple species that uh, will, will, could and do occupy the same habitats. And, and fish species are a great example. Um, I think the sage grouse effort has led us to look at the sagebrush ecosystem because for, for a lot of you know, Brian knows this very well and better than I do, but this, the greater sage grouse was just one bird species of, of five or six that could be potentially listed um, in the future. And it's all related to, to sagebrush management, sagebrush uh, ecosystems that uh, are possibly being um, uh, re removed or, or degraded in, in any way. But, I think I think it's a chance for, but the but the problem is is when the listing can, comes in, the service has a, has a set timeline to respond, and they're going to respond. It doesn't allow us to look back at ecosystems unless we get proactive and step back. I think which we're doing as a result of the greater sage grouse. I think if we have our state wildlife action plans also provide a little bit of that, but that's something that if we were to pop our heads up from underneath the water, had the right partnerships had the funding and ability to do that I think that would 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 allow us to do a lot more conservation a lot more partnering at that level um, we have that ability as well under habitat conservation plans I think that's the original intent for those areas this is the for, for that that you some of you don't know it's section 10 of the act that the service uh, supports very much is the development of habitat conservation plans that allow us to look at listed species and not listed species and then how can we get incidental take coverage for those those uh, those efforts or lawful so I I think that's something that we're all in the conservation community is really looking at doing um, it's just how much and when do will we have the time to do that um, you know with all of our partners so Good question. And I'd like to yeah, go ahead, address sure. that as a, a elected local official. And, and really my experience is only with the greater sage grouse. And when I, I go back and, and look at how this all got started through a, a Sioux Settle Agreement, and I, I take that Sioux Settle Agreement as I see a smoky room with uh, uh, the 
plaintiffs or the people in there and the people from U.S. Fish and Wildlife that really want to uh, see this, potentially see this bird listed and there's no transparency and I, I alluded to the fact there's somewhere between 350,000 to 500,000 birds in western United States which is a significant population and uh, and so I, that that part of the the process bothers me so go ahead Representative. I will say Director Brochet brought with him from Arizona perspective on planning and I think that's you know we now understand the value of coming to the table with a plan in place and certainly multiple species habitat is an area that we could address before we start talking about a specific species but you know from I talked about having how few legislators in our legislature really uh, rural and you know I, I'm no longer on natural resource I'm now on the budget committee and the Colorado budget is an endangered species I mean so you know squeezing money out to get ahead of the game is always an argument you know always a discussion that we need to have but certainly from the legislative point of view we need to be thinking about uh, you know those those plans that are in place before the issue comes up what else yeah I'll just touch on the fact that I, I I agree completely with what Bob had said that it, I think that it's uh, the intent of the act is not simply single species it's also looking at uh, habitats and landscapes as a whole but it's also uh, a great opportunity to, to, to stave off you know uh, those future uh, much more difficult to deal with listing efforts uh, greater engagement sage grouse are difficult um, sage thrash is really difficult um, and even more so, at least in the case of Western Colorado and really um, all across the West, where we've seen sort of systemic um, protracted declines in mule deer populations over the last 30 years, this is going to be a saving grace. And that's a huge deal to not just the customer culture of you know, sportsmen like me, but it's also about local economies that um, derive a, a fair deal of, of income from uh, tourist uh, hunting and, and, and fishing and, and coming in um, and, and getting through uh, those long dark winters that we have in places like Moffat County. One thing I'll add on to that too, uh, Brian, to your, to your question was is that I don't want to leave the group with the impression that this is a, a wildlife thing. Um, in Colorado, I mean one, one great example I think Representative Rankin brought it is, is the ability to plan at the county level um, would inform this plan, this habitat-based plan, and Governor Hickenlooper just signed the Colorado Water Plan. I mean, the biggest, biggest plan for how we're going to manage water in this state absolutely translates to how do we then, how do we restore riparian and fish species and recover them in this in this state? And there's several of those big plans that I think are starting to fall into place that will drive that discussion. Um, which prior to we probably didn't, we couldn't, and, and we're reactive. Well, this is a proactive approach. So. so I think, I know there's other questions out there, but I've got to kind of balance that with moving the, the agenda on the way WAJA wants. So first, join me in thanking what was a great panel. We, we have now a 15-minute break right right outside, um, and 